Okay, uh, this is the Micro One Lecture for um, the 28th of April. Um, and what I want to do today is just cover, um, uh, start talking about the test a little bit. I, I might mention a little bit about the projects, but uh, I think I'll save that for the, uh, uh, um, for the help sessions uh, that we do on Zoom. Um, all right, so, um, so let me talk about the test. Uh, so it'll be online, it'll be multiple choice, and we're going to do the test on the 7th, uh, which is a Thursday. It's the last, last class day. Um, so, uh, so let me just go through. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll kind of I'll put some of these up here and we'll look at them a little bit. All right, so, um, so here's a test from back when. So... Debug tools are important in embedded design because code development is, awful, is often the critical thing to get right for new products. Yeah, that's absolutely the case in many, many cases. The human interface issues uh, are often, they really drive things. Uh, if you think about, like, you know, you, I've talked about my Samsung refrigerator. Um, and, you know, it's the, the fact that the compressor keeps things cool. I don't really think about that. I mean, if it goes out. That's going to be something I would think about. Clearly, that's an expensive item. But the way I mostly interact with this refrigerator is, uh, uh, besides opening the doors and taking things out and putting things in, is through the little front panel where I'm, where I'm getting uh, ice and water and I'm you know making an occasional input to control the refrigerator. And that front panel interface is horrible. And so my whole attitude toward this refrigerator has really been formed by that. Turns out, I mean, there are some really nice features about the refrigerator. One of them is it actually has two cooling coils. It has it has a uh, an evaporator coil in the refrigerator section, has an evaporator coil in the freezer section, and that most refrigerators don't have that. Most have a single evaporator coil, and then they blow the air around from the they blow a little bit of the cold air out of the freezer side into the refrigerator side, and they have a little flapper valve and they control the fan. And that's how they adjust the temperature on the freezer side, which I guess that works fine in most cases. But it's a if your freezer goes out and you have to wait, you know, a week for a repairman or something, you your refrigerator will still work fine, and vice versa. So you can kind of see there is a little bit of a, there is a little bit of a, of of advantage to having the two evaporator coils, and also you you definitely get a little better. Uh, control over temperature that way. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's actually kind of an interesting thing. Um, so anyhow, um, and obviously when you blow air out of the freezer side, you're pulling air into the freezer side. So you're you're making the freezer side have to work a little harder to stay cool. And if you don't open the door much on that side, then the two coil system really can change the energy equation a little bit. So it's so, but I don't see that feature, right? I don't interact with that feature. What I see about the refrigerator is the human interface. It's very similar to, uh, you know, uh, back when I used to do a lot of surgery, one of the things you know as a surgeon, patients don't see what you did inside. Uh, they don't see if you had really nice pedicles or if you had, you know, really rough, you know, bad blunt dissection and you, and you had big pedicles with lots of necrotic skin. They don't see that. Uh, all they see is where you sewed the, the, the skin, the scar. And if you did a really nice job of that, they think you're a great surgeon. If you did a bad job of that, then, then they think you're a crappy surgeon. But it's, it's that cosmetic front that really, uh, you know, it drives pa patient perceptions. Same thing with engineering. It's that human interface that really drives perception. So that's an important thing to consider. All right. Well, okay. So, so. Yes, code development is often one of the critical things. Good debug tools make finding errors in the code easier. Absolutely true. Uh, so uh, debug tools can focus the developer's attention on the part of the code that's not working as expected. Uh, yes, they can do that. Debug tools can allow the developer to follow variables in watch windows. Yes. With Picket 3 or with the, uh, with the Snap, we can only have two breakpoints active at the same time. Yes, uh, that's, that's hardware breakpoints, but you can have a bunch of software breakpoints. Special headers allow chips to use pins normally taken up by our, by our in-circuit programmer debugger to be brought out separately and thus free up the regular pins. Yes, when you get to the screen that you always say none and you skip by where it uh, wants you to specify the header, that would be one of those special 
header chips that uh, that can uh, have the programmer debugger hooked up and still use the pins that normally would be used for that. Um, both MPLabX and CodeWire 10.5 have watch windows and breakpoints. Yes, time spent learning debug tools is often wasted time. No, it's actually very valuable time. Which of the following? Uh, uh, so we only covered the KL25Z a little bit and the PIC 16. So which processor has a relocatable stack? Well, the PIC doesn't. It's got a 16 level hardware stack. So that would have to be the KL25Z. Which one has Harvard? Well, you should know the PIC is a Harvard architecture. <coughs> the KL is the KL is uh, is von Neumann. All, all of it's in one linear 32 gigabyte address space. Uh, whereas in the PIC you have uh, a separate program memory, separate data bus for the program memory, separate address bus, separate word size. It has 14 bit word size. Whereas in the data memory everything's 8 bits. Has an 8 bit data bus. Has an eight, has a uh, different size address bus. Uh, the address bus on the data side is only 12 bits, uh, but on the uh, on the program side, it's uh, it's uh, 15 bits. So there's quite a difference. And of course, the ad uh, the the data bus on the program side is 14 bits. Um, which ones have at least 1K of RAM? Well, they both do. The PIC only has 1K, but uh, and the and the KL25Z has 6K. Which one has 14-bit instructions? That would be the PIC. Uh, most of the instructions on the KL25Z are 16-bit instructions, and there are six 32-bit instructions. Which one has built-in uh, A to D capability? Both, they both have that. Uh, although the KL25Z is A to D is a little fancier. Which ones have interrupt capability? Both, but the interrupt f features on the KL25Z are certainly fancier. Has four levels of interrupt uh, priority. Can You can interrupt interrupts with higher priority interrupts. Um, mm. And uh, there is an interrupt vector table that allows you to uh, go directly to the ISR for each specific interrupt without having to figure out what caused the interrupt and then to go to the right place. Um, and finally, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, well, that's okay. Um, which have which have the clock turn which 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 one do you have to turn the clock onto the module to use it? Well, in KL25Z, you do have to turn clocks on to modules before you can do anything, even the even the GPIO ports. Uh, whereas in the PIC, you don't have to do that. Which ones have uh, have word and half word aligned addresses? That would be the KL25Z. Everything on the PIC is eight bits, but the KL25Z can do thirty-two bit. Uh, loads and stores, and it can do 16-bit loads and stores and 8-bit loads and stores. Why do micros have on-chip peripheral modules like PWM, A to D, UART? Uh, pick the best choice for the answer here. So to provide functions for which there are no external components available? Well, no. I mean, it is true that you can bit bang uh, an unusual um, um, uh, uh, decode sequence or whatever, uh, uh, so that's one really nice feature, uh, but um, that's not really the purpose of having the onboard modules to reduce power to reduce power and heat generation. Well, not really to cut development time cost and chip count. Yes, that's really the driver. Uh, with the onboard peripherals, you typically can get those working a lot faster, and you already have them all on the chip, so you you only have to have one chip and not a bunch of chips. Indicate the true or uh, uh, true or indicate true or false for the following statements about battery-operated microprocessor applications. The voltage regulator we use is a good choice for battery-operated devices needing long battery times. No, it's a bad choice because it's burning up energy the whole time the battery is connected, and even when you're using the device, uh, depends on your battery voltage and the regulator. But a lot of uh, energy is, is lost in the voltage regulator um, because it's not a switcher. It just it just creates a voltage drop. And uh, when we use a 9-volt battery, because our if you run your chip at 3.3 volts, uh, then you, you have 5.7 volts dropped across the regulator from a 9-volt battery and only 3.3 volts dropped across the microprocessor. So if the microprocessor is drawing, say, 60 milliamps, uh, that 60 milliamps is, is uh, delivering a lot more power, losing a lot more power in the regulator than it's actually using in the microprocessor. 
The power lost in a switching voltage regulator is a direct function of the voltage drop and current delivered to the load. Uh, yes. When running the Viva board at 3.3 volts, drawing 20 milliamps, uh, the power in milliwatts lost in the regulator using a 9 volt battery is 9 minus 3.3 times 20. Yes, that's correct. Pick the three best factors below uh, pushing embedded designs towards higher level languages like C. Um, larger on chip flash, larger on chip EEPROM, faster CPU clocks, more GPIO ports, lower power, shorter time for design. So clearly, a shorter time for design favors a higher level language. Um, lower power is not really a factor. More GPIO ports, it's not really a factor either. Uh, but faster CPU clocks, uh, yeah, because uh, it's, it, but that's not really the key. Larger on chip flash, yeah, that's that's definitely. There's no question. C programs take up a little more room than assembly language programs. Larger on chip EEPROM, yeah, the on chip EEPROM doesn't really play into that at all. Uh, the EEPROM is just for non-volatile storage of variables from when you powered the device off to power it back on. You can say things in EEPROM that will stay. Uh, and not be uh, and not be erased by powering it on and off. If a pin on if a pin on the pick of the KL twenty five C is set as an input but left unconnected, it will read as yeah. yeah it, it may read as either one, but it won't read the same. Uh, and may 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 read as either one, and um, may not read the same. Yeah. Well, that's right. Uh, so you don't really know how it's going to read. A lot of times they will, they will float high. So you should never have an input that's left unconnected. Uh, the trend in embedded design is to choose a processor with all the needed modules built in so very few additional chips are needed. This is true because additional chips increase the cost, yes. Additional chips increase the size of the board, yes. Additional chips slow, slow the device down, no, not necessarily. Additional chips complicate the design, yes, it does. Write a short C segment of code to swap the variables in X and Y given the following. So you have uh, X and Y and Z are ints. Well, what you do is you take X and save it so you let Z equal X. Then you let uh, Y equal X. Sorry. Uh, you let Z equal, uh, Z equal X. Then you let X equal Y. Then you let Y equal Z. Uh, all right. Uh, you want to be careful not to destroy the values of X and Y until you've saved them. Write a short pick assembly loop. Okay, I, we're not going to we're not going to have this on the test, but but basically, you remember the first thing you have to do is pick a create a variable in this case Z. So you first have to load Z up with uh, seven. So it, the first thing you have to do is move seven to the W register. You can use a uh, uh, move move move. Uh, M O V L W move local to W, so you put that 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 sevens in the instruction itself, and then you move uh, W to F. You move uh, what the seven you sort in W to the registers to the location Z, and then uh, you go into the loop. You label the first the beginning of the loop, and then you go through. And then when you get down uh, to the end, uh, here's where. Uh, we need to do the loop instruct. The, the, we need to do the decrement skip, uh, decrement f skip on zero. So we decrement. F, so we bank cell z. We decrement f skip on zero z, and uh, and then um, if um, yeah, if it's uh, well, here's where we figure it out. Whether once z cuts down to zero, then the decrement f skip on zero skips. And the instruction that follows the, the decrement F skip on zero instruction is a is a go to loop A. So that branch is skipped when uh, when we've counted when we've done this seven times. Remember the uh, the decrement F skip on zero, uh, then Z comma F. You want to leave the result in F. By default, it actually does go there. So even if you forget the F, it will still be okay. But you should do that second operand. Remember, almost all the byte-oriented instructions take second operands, and um, so be sure and keep that in mind. All right. Um, okay. Uh, there's an error in my code. Circle it for extra points. Okay. So. Um,
I don't know. Let's see. Uh, let's see. MOVLW, 20. Banks of Port A. <sighs> oh, that five. That five, uh, you can't do that. It's it, When you exclusive are Port A with W, you can choose to leave the result in W or F. Those are your choices. Five is not one of those choices. Five is a number that won't even fit in the single bit that's allowed. So that's that's the error. Okay. Um, okay. And then here is uh, December 9th. Oh, I see. These are 80. Yeah, okay. We don't need to do that. Uh, probably won't ask it too many of those things. I, I may ask some questions about those. Well, maybe I should. Um, okay, well, so so A to D. Uh, well, maybe I won't. Okay, so let me go to the next one. See how this changed. Okay, so um, so so here's some general questions. So the Viva board has a number of features that make it useful for lab projects. Evaluate the following statements as true or false. Touch sense pads modestly increase the cost of a printed circuit board. They don't really increase the cost at all. Maybe maybe just a teeny bit because you do have to have a little more space, but uh, assuming you can find space on the board, they really wouldn't increase the cost at all. Connections to the programmer, in their case a snap, not the picket three, allow in-circuit programming and debugging, yes. When the jumper is in the reset position, uh, still leaves a 10k pull up on RB5. Actually, it doesn't. Uh, in our case, uh, it only puts the 10k pull up on RB5. In fact, it's not even a 10k, it's a 50k. It doesn't put that pull up on RB5 until you actually put the jumper on the push button. And it's not RB5, it's RB7. Uh, the operating voltage could be modified to, to 5 volts by replacing the regulator. So you have your choice of two different regulators, 3.3 and 5, and you can jump or select that. But in the old days, we had a 3.3 regulator. If you really wanted 5 volts, then you had to put on a new regulator. Bypass caps work the same wherever they're placed on the board. False. Uh, by, 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 by their very nature, we want the bypass caps to be as close as possible to the chip that we're trying to, to bypass. And what we're really doing with these is we're trying to do two things. One, when the chip surges, when a bunch of uh, uh, CMOS transistors flip, uh, they draw current. They normally draw current mostly only when they flip, uh, although as our feature size gets smaller and smaller, the leakage current uh, be between flips is getting almost the same size as the uh, as the, the switching current. So that that concept actually is going to go away. But, but most of our architecture, uh, every time the clock causes the transistors to flip and change, uh, there's a big little spike, and so we put a we put a decent size cap, maybe a, maybe a one microfarad cap, very near the the chip, uh, so that it can provide that little burst of power when it's needed. Um, also, uh, the uh, um, we also are trying to cover the situation where there's noise on the on the line, and we want to we want to filter out some of the high frequency noise. So a big capacitor is not really good at, at filtering out high frequency noise. So that's why we need, uh, we also would like to have a small value capacitor. And if you look at your board, you'll see we have a big cap and a little cap um, uh, very close to the uh, to the pick chip. And, and that's really a pretty good design to do it that way. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Hello World LED pre prevents RA5 pin from being used as a regular output. Um, well, it, it is now, but it, but was prevented, and that's I think that's um, well, that's not true. Hello World LED prevents the RA5 pin from being used as a regular output. False. You can still use it as a regular output. You, it's just going to blink the LED as well. There's maybe a slight extra load on it, but. Uh, in most cases, that won't be significant. And where it is, then you have to deal with that. Um, okay, uh, relocatable stack. Well, we've already been through this, Harvard. Um, okay, yeah, we did all those. Uh, why do micros have on-chip peripheral modules? Um, yeah, okay. 
Um, so features of a micro that make it attractive for mobile battery operated devices include uh, power bar linear regulator. No, that's not an attractive feature. Ability to turn clocks on and off to unused modules. Yes, that is. That's what the KL25Z has. That's why it can get down to really low, uh, really low weight, yeah, really very small uh, power usage when uh, everything's turned off. Ability to turn clocks off to unsold modules. True. Um, fast wake up, uh, fast wake up from sleep mode. Yes, it does have a fast wake up from sleep. Small size, yes. Uh, small size and uh, ability to, well, small size. So, uh, yes, small size is always good for mobile operations. Ability to operate over a range of supply voltages. Yes, that's really helpful. If you just uh, if you just connect it to the battery, as the battery discharges, the supply voltage continuously goes down, 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 down. Having a brownout detection built in. Yes, very helpful. Uh, you want, if you think about what does brownout do? Brownout brownout keeps the chip from as the voltage as the battery voltage falls, the chip's working, it's working, it's working, and then finally you'll get to the point where if you don't have a brownout detector so that it graciously shuts the chip down when the voltage goes below a certain level. What will happen is, at some point, some features of the chip may stop working, whereas others may continue to work. And that sets you up for the possibility of, of uh, overriding some of your program memory, or maybe uh, executing an instruction but not executing it correctly, so doing something that you never intended the, the device to do. Uh, so you don't want it to fail uh, in a in a in a random way like that, you want it to fail graciously. Uh, so basically, when it, the voltage drops below a certain level, it's still working totally properly up until that point, and then at that point, it just shuts down completely. And then when you uh, uh, when you charge up the battery or do what it replace the batteries, then it's going to be able to work again. All right. Um, same thing on the input. Remember, a floating input is bad. It's never. It's it's never. It's always. Um, you don't know whether it's going to be high or low, and it can vary. So, and it won't always read the same. The trend in embedded design is to choose processor with all the needed modules built in so uh, that few additional chips are needed. This is true because additional chips increase the cost, yes. Additional chips increase the size uh, on the board, and uh, additional chips slow the device down. All true. Um, well, okay. The last one's not true. Uh, it does, there's no guarantee. The additional chips might slow it down, but they also might speed it up because the additional chip might be a lot faster. All right, the watchdog timer, uh, our COP timer on the KL25Z is useful for the following. Helping to make programs fail safe, yes. Making development time shorter, uh, not really. Recurring, uh, recurring an embedded processor in the field gets caught and falls in a uh, false infinite loop. Re so sorry, I'm having trouble focusing on this. It's rescuing an embedded processor in the field that gets caught in an infinite loop. Yes, that's right. Reducing the power consumption of a mobile device. That is um, that uh, is not the case. Um, okay. Indicate which of the which are true about embedded design. Software development is usually the hardest part. Yes, the trend in embedded design is to move to assembly language to get faster code. Not really. It's actually the trend is to move to C because you have uh, bigger places to store our programs and our processes run fast enough that uh, running C doesn't is not a, a isn't isn't a, a problem. A good integrated development environment should provide minimal debug features. No, that's not true. We want lots of robust debug features. Cost of the final design will usually be higher with more external chips required. Yes, the more external chips, probably the more expensive it's going to be. Write a short C segment of code to swap the values. Okay, we've talked about that. Um, uh, write a segment of code to wait till port A uh, pin 4 goes high. So you want uh, while, not RA4. Uh, and you want to use the uh, explanation point uh, for that. Given this code at the start of your primary routine, answer the true or false the following questions. Okay, so we bank cell tris, we bit set f tris a bit 4, so we make pin 4 an input, and then we bank cell port a. Uh, so bit test f skip, uh, bit test f skip would skip the next instruction if pin 4 has a 3.3 .3 volt on it. So 
um, so bit test f skip set port a comma four. So that that is true. Bits uh, bit set f port a comma four would set uh, ra four to output three point three volts. That's correct. Um, uh, you could write a one to port a pin four, but you might also still read a zero. Yes, that's true. But what if the pin shorted? Your your uh, your, your read command or your write command writes to the flip flop, but your read command reads the pin. Um, and in fact, if you have it set as an input, you could definitely do that. Bit test F skip clear port A would skip the next instruction if pin 4 has 3.3 volts on it. Uh, yes. Okay, that's good. Um, and then you need to know how to create a mask. I'm not going to go over this, but uh, create a 32-bit mask one that will clear bit 25. So all you do is one left arrow, left arrow, 25. And then you want to clear it, so you invert the mask, and then you do ampersand equals mask one. So, But you do have to remember the bitwise tilde out there to the side so that you clear that mask. Um, okay, ow, ooh, ouch. Put an X on the programmer's model that registers in the PIC. Um, okay, so the Tris A is not in the programmer's model. The, the program counter low is. Um, the OSCON is not. The W register is. The BSR is. The PC latch high is. Port A is not. Status is. And turns out the uh, indirect uh, uh, zero is. Uh, part of the programmer's model, but we didn't uh, really discuss that much, so I'm not going to pimp you on that. All right, and I think that's it. All right, very good. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think so. That's a pretty that's a pretty good example of the kind of questions that'll be on the test. Uh, I'm probably going to uh, 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 so it's going to be mostly multiple choice. There may be maybe some multiple answers, and there are also maybe a lot of true and false as well. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. All right, um, let's see, what else? Um, I think I'll deal with uh, helping students, uh, helping you guys with your code in the help session. And uh, so, um, and I'll probably do, uh, I think I have a help session. Uh, I can't remember what we set up. I'm so confused, but. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think there is a help session this evening, and uh, yeah, I don't remember when. I'll send out an email with an invitation though when I figure it out, and uh, I'll probably do. I'll probably do a little quiz after this lecture as well. All right, that should do it. We'll talk to you later.